My name is Lisa Cooper. Thank you for joining me for this virtual presentation. I was due to be in America in March to give a presentation to the Altadena Library, uh, which obviously had to be cancelled. But I'm hoping that when the present situation is over, I'll be able to reschedule and come and uh, talk to you in person. And I'm going to be talking about my book, A Forgotten Land. This book is my grandmother's story. It's also an LA story, although you wouldn't necessarily imagine that from my accent. My grandmother's name was Pearl. She was born in the Russian Empire in a small town called Pavlich, which is about 60 miles from Kiev in present day Ukraine. But she lived for the last 30 years or so of her life in Los Angeles in a small apartment in West Hollywood, North Orange Grove Avenue. Um, in a little apartment that she shared with her sister Rachel. And this was the only home of my grandmother's that I ever knew. And I do remember it very vividly, even though I lived in England and we only visited very rarely during my childhood in the 1970s and 1980s. So the story I'm going to tell is of Pearl's early life back in Russia in the early part of the 20th century. It was a very dramatic period of Russian history, a period of great upheaval and terrible suffering, and especially for the Jews. But it's also a story of remarkable resilience, bravery and hope. And it's a story of ordinary people trying to lead, lead ordinary lives, but in very extraordinary times. So in the picture, Pearl is the girl with the long hair um, in the, right in the middle of the picture, seated between her older sister, Sarah, and her father. And this picture probably would have been taken about 1914, probably shortly before the outbreak of World War I. And in fact, Pearl's father, um, there on to her left, to, to the left, on the left of the picture, um, died just a few years later. Now, Pavlich, the town where Pearl lived, was a melting pot of different nationalities and religions. Pearl grew up speaking Yiddish, interming intermingled with batterings of Polish, Ukrainian, Russian. And on her mother's side, the family were prosperous grain dealers. And on, the father, on her father's side, they were religious scholars. Um, they were terribly poor, but as scholars, they were very highly respected in the Jewish community. So Pearl's mother died when she was six. That's her mother there with um, Pearl, the little girl standing in the middle. And that's her older sister, Sarah, and her brother, Nathan, Naftila, as he was known back in Russia, uh, sitting on his mother's lap. And there was another daughter, Rahul, was born after that picture was taken. So Pearl's mother died when she was six. And after this, Pearl was brought up by her grandparents, Beryl and Pessy, in a large house that also served as a warehouse for her grandfather's grain business. My grandmother was the second of four children. Um, and in the same house as them also lived two younger cousins. Now, all six of these children were orphaned fairly young, leaving them in the care of their grandparents. Uh, this is her grandmother, Baba Pessy, as she was known. Um, now, Pessy, like all, uh, probably all Jewish grandmothers at the time, she was terrified of the evil eye, um, which was, um, it, if something bad happened in the family, uh, it, was, it was bound to be because somebody had cast an evil eye on you. Um, if a child got sick or you know, business went under or whatever. And uh, what you had to do then was uh, try and find out who had cast the evil eye and take a thread from, uh, from their clothing or hair from, a hair from their head and that would be burnt. Uh, you'd on, on over hot coals in a kind of cauldron. I imagine it a bit like um, a bit like the witches in, in Macbeth or something. Um, you would go and see someone who was an expert in expelling the evil eye and they would uh, chant some incantations and spit three times and that was supposed to uh, expel the evil eye. Um, now, Pessy also thought that cam a camera could cast an evil eye on her. So for, for a very long time, she refused to have her photo taken. Uh, this is the earliest photo we have of her when she's already quite an old lady. Um, I think probably by this time she thought, well, I'm old now, so what the heck. Um, so before, before Pearl was born, and in particular in the period 1881 to 1905, the Pale of Settlement, that was the area where the Jews were uh, restricted to living under the Tsars in Russia. Um, the Pale saw terrible violence against the Jews, the pogroms as we know them. Um, and these were tolerated and even encouraged by the Tsar. Um, I'm going to 
reading, I'll be giving a few readings from the book. Uh, this is the first one, talking about the pogroms of 1881. Ha, huh, that'll serve the man right, were grandfather's first words when he heard of the ex explosion that had killed Tsar Alexander II. Although the Tsar had achieved a reputation as a great reformer for freeing the serfs, Bell grumbled that he hadn't done so much to emancipate the Jews. It was true that our people gained some limited freedoms under his rule. Forced conscription of children was halted. More children, more Jews were able to attend Russian schools and universities, but emancipation, this most definitely was not. My grandfather was soon eating his words, however, for the events that ensued rocked the lives not just of my family, but of every single Jew right across the pale. After the Tsar's assassination, rumours began to spread. To begin with, the Jews weren't aware of the gossip and whispering. It took place surreptitiously inside houses in the Christian parts of towns. But then it spread to the shops, the markets and the train stations. The rumours were everywhere. It was Jewish revolutionaries that had killed the Tsar and it was time for revenge. Inebriated mobs pulled down market stalls, smashed shop windows and kicked in doors in towns and cities across the pale. Velvet dresses and woolen shawls, picture frames and broken chair legs, cabbages, bottle plums, all were trampled underfoot or piled up in grotesque mountains of mud. And everywhere there was screaming, running feet, fearful faces trying to stay out of sight. A snowstorm of white feathers cascaded out of windows and hovered in the air, having been ripped from the confines of mattresses and pillows. Some of the rioters dressed themselves up in new outfits, stolen from the ready-made clothes stores piling one layer over another, shirts over jackets and underwear over trousers, until, the, until they looked like characters in some absurd stage play. How to count the cost? How many honest traders and merchants bankrupted? How many families bereft of all that they had spent their whole lives working towards? How many children so traumatized that they would forever relive the fear in their dreams? So as I said, that was in 1881. And these waves of violence against the Jews were repeated regularly over the next few years, and then eventually they died down again. But a second major wave of pogroms began in 1905, um, and that was the year that the first major signs of revolution were felt in Russia. The Russian Revolution as we know it didn't really take place until 1917, 12 years later. But 1905 saw rebellions and uprisings and workers striking, marching through the streets, waving red banners. Lots of Jews joined in the marching and the demonstrations, protesting about the discriminations that still affect, affected them in their daily lives. And once again, just like the last time, this caused an anti-Semitic backlash, and this time even more bloody than in 1881. As well as raiding Jewish, jobs, Jewish shops and businesses, the so-called Black Hundreds killed Jews in their own homes and even hacked people to death in the streets. But most of the violence was restricted to the major towns and cities. Small towns like Pavlich, where my family lived, were generally spared. And although they lived with the fear of what was going on elsewhere, people generally continued to lead a normal life. I've got two readings about what life was like in my grandmother's childhood. Here she is talking about her day-to-day -day life as a child. I had few cares as a young child. Just as my mother had been cosseted in her youth, my sister Sarah and I were brought up like the daughters of a princess. Our mother shunned the local tailor and instead we travelled to the town of Vidichev to visit the dressmaker who made us fashionable outfits fringed with velvet and lace. I loved these visits to the city. I was always enthralled by the clamour of the market traders and the horse-drawn streetcars that chattered along the cobblestone, clattered along the cobblestones. And then there was the excitement of collecting our new clothes. We believed we'd be the best dressed girls in all of Pavlich. Like our mother before us, we girls were never taught to sew or darn or cook. Grandmother, the Baba Pessy, was responsible for looking after the needs of the entire household as well as keeping, as well as helping grandfather by collecting the tating, takings from his warehouse and keeping his books up to date. A tiny energetic woman whose life sorrow was reflected in her eyes. Um, you can see it in the photo there. She was the linchpin of the family. Baba never let a single second go to, go to waste. Excuse me. Um, every morning she would rise at daybreak to milk her cow, light the fires and then set to work on the kitchen floor scrubbing the flagstones until they sparkled. As her children and grandchildren washed and dressed, 
she prepared the table for breakfast. The kitchen was her domain and she ruled it as strictly and efficiently as grandfather ran his warehouse. In any quiet moment, she was always to be found there, knitting needles clicking, a ball of wool trailing across the floor as she engaged in the never ending task of knitting and darning the family socks and stockings. Uh, my second reading gives an insight into her grandfather's life as a grain dealer and how people did business in those days. And sadly, we don't have any photos of, um, of Pearl's grandfather, and I believe he would have considered it a bit too frivolous to, um, to sit before a photographer. He was a, a pretty serious, um, slightly ferocious man, uh, by all accounts. So here's, uh, here's the grandfather's life. International commerce, in an era before telephones and without established rates of exchange, was a complex and time-consuming affair. Every day, my grandfather's driver waited with a coach and horse to take him to the train station at Papilna, a small town 12 miles from Pavlich, where he would await news from every train that passed of the prices currently being paid for different products further up or down the line, market rates in Kiev and export prices in Odessa, the region's major port. The railway station was a daunting place for outsiders. When I was little, this is Pearl speaking, when I was little, I occasionally travelled to visit relatives by train with my parents. I remember dodging between the swarms of traders from all over the area who congregated to discuss prices and close deals with travelling businessmen. My father would scoop me up in his arms so I didn't get lost or trampled, and the noise was so loud with frenzied, frenzied shouts and hand gestures from all sides that I couldn't understand how anyone was able to follow what was going on. But everything changed there at the train station and uh, with her grandfather's business in 1914 when the war broke out. Now my grandmother was about 12 years old at the start of World War I and although the battlefields were thousands of miles away from Pavlich, the war still had a profound effect on the town that my family came from and on the lives of everybody who lived there. And the comfortable life that my grandmother had lived up until that point was shattered once and for all. So one of the first changes they would have noticed had a huge effect on Pearl's grandfather's grain business. So that's been my next reading. After Germany declared war in 1914, the train station at Papilna changed from a stock exchange to an army embarkation point. Goods trains no longer brought news of grain prices from Kiev and Odessa, but transported military apparel to the distant front and passenger passenger services were replaced by troop carriers. Instead of throbbing with merchants and speculators, the train stations were drenched in the tears of mothers, wives and children, waving their beloved goodbye as they ran along the platform until it ended and they could run no further. Instead of talk of prices, bushels, foods and exchanges, all conversation was of mobilisation, detachments, regiments and ultimatums. My grandfather's routine was disrupted without his trips to the station. Although the scope of his business no longer required him to visit Popilna every day, he still undertook the journey once or twice a week. Now even this was denied him and he began to pace around the house restlessly. He missed his outings and the social contact they provided and he despaired of the murkiness that was settling over grain prices. The daily dealings at the, at the train station had kept pricing transparent. Dealers knew how much was being paid for each product at every location. Now it was impossible to keep track. To make matters worse, inflation had started to increase, making it more important than ever to keep a close eye on the market. But exchange rates, tariffs and prices were all becoming harder and harder to gauge. They rose gradually at first, then faster and faster until they were running out of control, like a downhill sledge on an, on an icy track. And all over Pavlich, families were fearful of their menfolk being sent off to war. Some of my grandmother's older cousins had already managed to escape to Canada to avoid being called up by the military authorities. But once the war started, it was too late to escape. Many men still tried to avoid conscription at any cost. And this was my family's experience. Thankfully, my father wasn't called up in the, to fight in the first months of the war. As the menfolk of Pavlich marched off the state to the station to fill the never ending line of trains heading to the front, I prayed every night and every day that father wouldn't one day join them. He wasn't meant for fighting, this gentle, studious man 
who still dressed every day in his long black coat and skull cap. The first wave of recruits were green ticketers. My father hoped to be granted a blue ticket, which mean, would mean he wasn't, he was allowed, excuse me, my father hoped to be granted a blue ticket, which would mean that he was allowed to study rather than go to war. Only the feeble-minded and the infirm were lucky enough to be granted a white ticket, which exempted them altogether, while those who failed the medical exam were red ticketers. Pavlich was full of young men trying to make themselves ill by fasting, drinking salty water, or overindulging in salted herring to, get, to gain a red ticket. The rich took a different tack by bribing doctors or officials to reject their sons. Meanwhile, the mothers of one or two young men we knew ran themselves ragged going from one office to another through the Warren of Russian officialdom, trying to, provoke, trying to prove that their last remaining boy should get the automatic exemption that applied to only sons. The official registers were notoriously inaccurate and many hadn't been updated properly when people died or emigrated, but the process of verifying that a son was unavailable for service could cause weeks of frustration and distress. Now, avoiding conscription was nothing new, especially in Jewish families. Um, the Jews were generally, on the, on the whole, studious, sort of peace-loving people, and not really, um, you know, not, not really soldier material. Um, so in, in my own family, uh, Pearl's great-grandfather, Akiva, um, to avoid conscription to the Crimean War, he had had all his teeth pulled out uh, to be rejected by the um, by the conscription officers. And later, uh, during the war between Turkey and Russia, the Russo-Turkish War, um, interestingly, two brothers um, on my on Pearl's father's side, her her grandfather and great uncle on her father's side. Um, had come up with a, a plan to avoid conscription by getting one of them adopted by a Ukrainian family. This is how our side of the family came out with this very, this very strange uh, surname Unikow, uh, which you see here based on the recollections of Pearl Unikow Cooper, Unikov it would have been uh, in Russia. Um, so Unikov isn't a Jewish name, it's a Ukrainian name. Um, and that stems from this plan they had to avoid conscription by getting the two brothers. So by having one of them adopted by another family, they both became an only son and therefore uh, were ineligible for, um, for the army. Um, later, um, Burl, the uh, grandfather, his brother had emigrated uh, to Canada to avoid the conscription of his two sons, Yankel and Haskell, um, in 1914. They were in a bit of a race against time as to which would arrive first, their conscription papers, their military call-up, or their um, papers to authorization papers uh, and their ship's passes for their emigration to Canada. And later, Pearl's brother, Nathan, uh, was called up to fight in the Red Army. Um, in the Soviet Union's first overseas war against Poland in 1920 and uh, that was when he escaped to Canada as well to, to avoid conscription to the Red Army. Uh, but with World War I, um, life became harder uh, for those left at home as food and equipment were sent away to the front, leaving very little to spare for those at home. So thanks to Pearl's grandfather's grain business, my family still had enough to eat, but in the city people were going hungry. And with insufficient fuel available, available for people to heat their homes, many were also getting sick as well. And as the war dragged on year after year, the hardships increased for the ordinary people of Russia. In the major cities, these hardships led to massive unrest, culminating eventually in the revolutions of 1917. So this began with the February Revolution when the Tsar was overthrown. And this was, which were followed by in, the, in October by the October Re Revolution when the Bolsheviks seized power. Now, small towns like Pavlich were fairly immune from the revolutionary fervor, but um, this is a description of what was happening in Kiev, about 60 miles away from Pavlich. And this would have been at the time of the February Revolution, the time of the overthrow of the Tsar. People talked openly, fearlessly in the streets about the end of the Tsar's reign. They talked about Russia withdrawing from the war and abandoning her allies. Power to the workers, people Soviets, 
Students handed out leaflets and waved red banners. What did it all mean? Would the war soon be over? Could the Tsar just resign? And how can workers take power? What are the Soviets? To a 15 year old girl in a small country town, the reports from the city were all very mysterious. But far away to the north in Petrograd, as the Russian capital was now called, the demonstrations were coming to a head. And at last they culminated in the Tsar's abdication. It was as if a black cloud had lifted from above our heads. Alexander Kerensky and the provisional government filled the power void left by Tsar Nicholas and represented everything we'd ever hoped for. My sister Sarah came home from school early, rejoicing that she would no longer have to sing the national anthem. The hated God Save the Tsar was now banned. The Pale of Settlement was dissolved at a single blow. That's the area where the Jews had been forced to live. Censorship was abolished and my grandfather began devouring newspapers and any other source of information that he could find, hungry for news that had not been previously considered fit for public consumption. Kerensky has come and it's like a blessing, my grandfather repeated again and again to anyone who would listen. No more Tsar, no more restrictions on Jewish jobs and residence permits. permits. Now we have the same rights as everybody else in the country. I didn't understand the politics of it all, but I could feel the difference in my daily life. The mood of oppression that had settled over Pavlich since the beginning of the war was suddenly lifted. People smiled, chatted, laughed. They talked about their hopes and dreams, voiced aspirations that they'd never dared speak about, about before. Some even danced in the street. My grandfather was more cheerful than he had been in years, and Baba's eyes, eyes sparkled in a way that I'd hardly ever seen. We're free, my children, we're free, she laughed when she first heard the news, scurrying around the room, hugging each of her grandchildren in turn. But Kerensky's leadership of the country was all too brief, ended by the Bolshevik Revolution in October. Now for ordinary people, the October Revolution caused great uncertainty. Ukraine was far away from Petrograd, um, St. Petersburg, as it is now, where the Bolshevik Revolution took place. And nobody knew very much about Lenin and his fellow revolutionaries. Certainly nobody could have predicted at that time that they would have remained in power for most of the 20th century. But one of the first things that the Bolsheviks did was to extricate Russian troops from the war. And this had a huge effect on places like Pavlich. Over the weeks that followed, the railways became a teeming mass of humanity. Not even my grandfather would dare, dare go to the station in Popilna now. His once daily haunt was heaving with unwashed bodies, many racked with disease and crawling with lice. As soldiers dribbled back home from distant lands, weak, thin and bedraggled like stray cats after a storm. From the window, I watched the slow trudging progress through the town of these gray bundles of bones, men who had once represented the Tsar's brave army. The townsfolk took pity on the returning troops and went out of their way to offer them soup and give them any old clothes or shoes they could spare. Even after three and a half years of wartime hardships, it was clear that the privation we had all suffered was nothing compared with the needs of the soldiers. But week after week, the ragged creatures kept on coming, more and more of them, and until people began to worry that if they kept giving away their food and clothing, they would have nothing left. And as the months passed, the reality dawned that the pale, unshaven men crisscrossing the countryside with guns couldn't all be soldiers returning to their homes after all. So who were these men? It eventually became clear that bands of armed thugs were roaming the land. It was impossible to tell who was who, but gradually all those generous souls in Pavlich who'd been welcoming the soldiers back with hot soup and instead began hiding away their potatoes and winter boots, lest the men take them all. The other thing that the Bolsheviks did after they gained power uh, was to start requisitioning grain from the countryside to feed the workers. And as well as taking grain from the peasants, they also raided the supplies of grain merchants like Pearl's grandfather. So this is what happened there. The Bolsheviks viewed merchants like my grandfather as class enemies. They also needed grain to feed their supporters in the cities which were running out of food. Grandfather knew that a knock on the door was inevitable, but when it came, he was still caught by surprise. My grandparents knew young Vanya well. He was Sasha the baker's son and lived down the road. They'd watched him grow up from a wailing baby in his mother's arms to a smart young schoolboy and later a recruit in the Tsar's army. When he came to the house, Baba almost shrieked as she pulled open the door. 
She barely recognised him in the black leather coat that reached down to his calves and his heavy black boots. In his hand was a wooden truncheon. He, he was surrounded by a group of youths, all in identical black clothes, talking loudly to one another. But Vanya was clearly their leader. My grandfather hurried to the door, alerted by the motion, by the commotion and the, and the rush of cold air. Vanya, he exclaimed, what are you doing here, young man? Vanya looked a little sheepish, perhaps embarrassed that his fellow Bolsheviks could see that he had associated with class enemies like my grandfather in the past. One of his red guards brushed Baba aside and headed towards the warehouse. The Bolsheviks are in charge now, and we need to take your grain to feed the workers in the towns, the youth dictated as he stamped through the house. But what about us? Who will feed us if you take away our grain? Baba countered. You bourgeois, you're all the same. The workers and peasants need bread if they're going to build socialism. Bread, land and freedom. Grandfather just sat in his chair and watched as Banya and his friends shoveled away his already diminished pyramids of grain until all that was left was a few thin scatterings of yellow spread over the grey stone floor like dirt that had come in from the street and needed sweeping up. He knew he couldn't argue with them. He had heard the news on the grapevine. Grain merchants all over Ukraine were having their stores ransacked. It was clear that from this day on, our lives would never be the same again. And all over the, all, excuse me, and although the Bolsheviks had pulled Russia out of the, the war, they failed to deliver peace. And all over Ukraine and other parts of the Russian Empire, the October Revolution gave way to anarchy. The newly formed bands of rebels and fighters were crisscrossing the land. Each group had a different allegiance. Some fought for nationalism, anarchism, the Holy Russia, and sometimes it seemed just for the sake of fighting. But this was the start of the civil war, and Pavlich in the surrounding area was the scene of many battles and atrocities from 1918 to 1920. And I'm going to recount just one of many inc incidents that took place during that time. This involved the White Army under the Cossack leader General Denikin. The Cossacks were fiercely anti-Bolshevik, but also anti-Semitic. Five huge men burst in through the front door. They were clad in tatty greatcoats that reached almost to the floor. Grease pencil marks indicated their rank, outlining stars that had once been sewn onto their shoulder straps. Long shining swords were tucked into their belts and they carried rifles fixed with rusty bayonets. The tops of their heads almost touched the ceiling and with each great stride they squeezed my grandparents into the corners of the room where they cowered, shaking. The whites weren't like the anarchist who bur anarchists who burst in and began smashing the furniture to pieces. They had brains and intuition that they used to figure out just where their victims might be hiding money or jewellery or hoarding food. The soldiers sniffed around like dogs, tapping at walls and floorboards, listening for a hollow echo that might indicate a hiding place. Money! Give us your money, old man, the first giant had demanded in Russian, prodding my grandfather with his bayonet. My grandfather's carefully learnt Russian seemed to desert him as he mumbled something incomprehensible, his eyes fixed on the scuffed leather boots of his interrogator. While his companions continued to search the house, kicking down the door to the warehouse, the leader of the group dealt my grandfather a swift blow with his rifle butt and watched my poor grandfather crumble to the floor like a rag doll. Then he kicked him in the stomach with his huge leather boots until grandfather curled into a ball on the hard kitchen floor as, pit as pitiful as a tiny child. Again and again he beat him with his gun and kicked him. By that time the other four soldiers had returned. Zadie wasn't a big man so it, it didn't take them long to hustle him onto the table, pull his scuffed leather belt from around his waist and force his head into the noose that they made with it. Then they hanged him from the hook on the kitchen ceiling that we used for drying meat. Uh, now Zadie did survive um, but only because the leather belt he was wearing snapped in two after the Cossacks had left. Um, and grandpa, my, my grandmother actually did talk about this belt um, earlier in her life. That, as, I, as I said before, her grandfather could be a bit fierce. And uh, at the Sabbath meal, he had a habit of taking off his belt and whacking his grandchildren with it over some misdemeanor they were supposed to have, um, supposed to have been responsible for. Um, I, I kind of like to think that it was all these beatings with the belt that weakened the belt enough to later on save his life. Um, 
And also I'd like to emphasize that that really was just one of many incidents that, um, that my family experienced. There was another time when uh, Pearl and her grandfather were let alone in the house for some reason and hiding in the attic when, when one of the banda, as she called them, um, came through. And uh, eventually the grandfather said, right, I'm, I'm going to, you know, we need to get out of here. Um, but Pearl had broken her leg. Her, she had her leg in a cast and wasn't able to, to run or you know, could barely walk. Um, so the grandfather went off and got a neighbour to come and rescue her. And he, he went off. And as the neighbour was on his way to Pearl's house to come and get her, a uh, shot rang out and he was killed. And both my grandma and her grandfather survived. You know, there were so many incidents um, over this period. Um, and that, that was just one or two. Um, by 1920, the Bolsheviks grip on power in Ukraine and become stronger. And these fightings and, and banda raids died down, although they hadn't yet stopped altogether. But what followed was a period of great hunger and deprivation. The Bolshevik government continued to requisition food supplies from the countryside and even in Ukraine, which was known as the breadbasket of Europe because of its, its high grain production. Even here, it was next to impossible to buy wheat or flour. And the Bolsheviks hadn't just requisitioned the grain, they also took the seed, uh, which meant that the peasants then obviously couldn't grow any crops for the following year. And the only bread that you could buy at that time was on the black market. And I've got a lovely quote about that. People said that flour made up only 5% of the loaf. The rest was a revolting blend of dried potato skins, mashed up soldiers' coats, or even dirt and mud from the road. It stuck to the roof of the mouth and trying to cut it with a bread knife was a wasted effort. You needed a saw. Even so, if someone was unwise enough to go out into the streets holding a piece of bread, children would steal it straight from their hands. So um, yeah, that's what bread was like. And as well as bread, sugar, potatoes, eggs, milk, all of these things uh, were either unavailable altogether or prohibitively expensive. And that's not to mention meat. And inflation was pushing prices up by the day. It reached a point where barter became the, mean, the main method of doing business. And it became increasingly, increasingly difficult for families to find enough food. So at this point, my grandmother was the one who took on the role of finding food for the family. She was not yet 20 years old. I can show you a picture of her around this time. Um, so that's Pearl on the left of, of the picture with her, with her two sisters, Sarah, seated in the middle, and Rachel perched on the side of the chair on the right. Um, but by this time, both her parents were dead. Uh, her grandparents were getting old and no longer had the strength to take on the role of finding food, and especially her grandfather after um, his experience of the hanging at the hands of the Cossacks. So to enable her, her grandparents and her siblings and those two cousins who also lived with them, who I mentioned at the beginning, to enable the whole family to survive, Pearl took on terrifying and dangerous journeys by train uh, to markets across the area. Now these markets were illegal, and if caught, my grandmother would have been shot. Um, so my next reading is a bit about what she experienced in just getting to these markets where she um, where she bartered and, and bought and sold food. It was still several years before regular train services were to resume. There were no timetables and no carriage, carriages for passengers. It wasn't possible to just buy a ticket and climb aboard. In fact, officially, ordinary people weren't allowed on board at all. Trains appeared whenever their cargoes of troops or, or goods or troops were ready. This meant sometimes they traveled through Papilna to Kiev or Odessa three times a day, and other times it was more like three times a week. Every so often they stopped at our station, but on many occasions they didn't. If the train didn't stop, I had to leap aboard while it was still moving and cling on for dear life until I had the chance to find a better spot. On a footplate between carriages, perched on top of a freight car, or crouch in the, crouching in the corner of an empty wagon. I learnt how to leap into the doorway of a freight car, to aim for the gap between the wagons, or even, if the train was travelling slowly enough, to crawl in between the wheels and work my way up to the carriage roof. Um, 
Not only were traders at risk, at risk of being attacked and robbed, but officials were known to offer bribes to informers in return for a hunk of bread or a handful of rubles. Any of these people could have reported me to the authorities for dealing in contraband goods. So to avoid the risk, I threw myself off the train before reaching the station and gave the whole area a wide berth. Jumping off was much worse than boarding the train in the first place. At least in winter, deep drifts of snow lay either side of the train tracks, creating a soft bed to land in. But when spring arrived, the embankments were piled high with blackened slush, which towered above deep puddles that I had to try and avoid. And later in summer, when the ground was hard, I came home spotted with inky bruises where I'd hit the ground. Now, Pearl spent three years doing this, um, traveling by train, uh, buying, selling, bartering, whatever she could to feed her family back in Pavlovich, sometimes staying away from home overnight. And on one memorable occasion, she got caught in a snowstorm and almost died from the cold. But uh, she was finally taken in by a kindly lady who, who looked after her and fed her until she was able to get home. And being very small, she was often able to hide in places where she could eavesdrop on conversations of other traders like herself and gain insights and information about where goods were being were available and she could use that information to her own advantage and by this means eventually she became a black market gold dealer and here's what she did my grandparents collected coins rings medals jewelry any gold that family friends or acquaintances still had young women gave earrings and bracelets that they had been saving for their wedding trousseau Mothers offered medals awarded to their dead sons for their bravery, and wives even gave up their wedding rings. All these goods were given to my grandparents on trust and hidden in, hidden in secret compartments that Baba sewed into my tattered coat. I took the gold hundreds of miles away to Kharkov. The, the journey was murderous. Once I jumped off the train in Kiev, I had to work my way across to the other side of the jumble of stinking huts that made up the main train station and leap aboard a train heading east. The trains were a different design from those traveling between Kiev and Odessa, and they offered no means of climbing onto the roof, nor even inside the carriages. Instead, I perched on the wooden boards that ran across the wheel axles. There was very little space. The icy wind whistled straight through me and the noise of the wheels on the trains on, on the tracks was almost deafening, but these tiny platforms were in great demand. Hands clawed at me and clung to my arms. Occasionally, with a sinister howl, the train would jerk or break fiercely and somebody tumbled from the platform. It would have been almost impossible not to fall under the wheels. Even if the train didn't stop, it took all day to reach Kharkov. More often, it stopped repeatedly in the middle of nowhere, the endless miles of woodland revealing nothing of, of our location. But I never dared jump down to stretch my legs. It was far too risky. There was no timetable to indicate when the train might move again. And besides, I was fearful of losing my precious spot above the wheels. If I gave it up, the other travellers might never let me back on board. At the end of each journey, I thanked God that I was still alive. Once in Kharkov, through a complex network of contacts, I was introduced to some shady dealers who asked me to follow them to the back of the market. I was almost shaking with nerves the first time that I stepped behind the brick wall that separated me from the other market traders who might have offered some protection. The men were gruff but brisk, well-dressed if not well-mannered. They inspected my goods meticulously, then handed over hard currency in return. I hid the money away carefully in my secret pockets before stepping back into the marketplace. And if caught, either with gold or with hard currency, uh, the penalty for my grandmother would have been the same. She would have been shot. Um, my grandmother wasn't the only person travelling illegally like this um, on the trains and buying and selling and bartering. There were thousands of other people doing exactly the same thing, taking enormous risks just to try and enable their families to get enough food to eat. But finally, my grandmother couldn't take it anymore and she felt that she had to escape from this terrifying life that she hated with a passion. Now, many Jews had emigrated from Russia during the years of the pogroms. And the first of our relatives to leave Russia had gone to Canada around 1903 and settled in Winnipeg. And then, as I mentioned, uh, subsequent family, men family members joined them um, when they were trying to avoid conscription. 
her brother Nathan, who'd uh, escaped in 1920 to avoid uh, conscription into the Red Army. He'd finally made it, it took him about three years to get to Canada. He had, that was a, a, another story in its own right. Um, and after that, finally in 1924, Pearl managed to go and join them in Canada. Over the course of a year or so, she raised enough money to bring the rest of her family to join her there. And uh, this is a lovely picture showing all the family reunited in Canada with Bubba Pessy in the middle. Um, she controlled the purse strings and all the children went out to work and they gave her the money at the end of the week. And she gave them each a, a kind of pocket money and, and she, she did all the cooking and the um, you know, shopping and the cooking and, and the laundry, just as she had back in Russia. Um, and the other thing I'd like to say about Baba Pessy is um, just how incredibly old she looks in this picture. Um, just testament to the incredibly tough life she led. She also gave birth to no fewer than 13 children, of whom only two survived into adulthood, my great-grandmother and the, the mother of the two cousins who, who lived with with grandma when they were children. Um, one of those uh, cousins is the youngest of the boys there on the right hand, the standing on the right hand side. That's, um, that's uh, one, of, one of the cousins and the others are her brothers and sisters. So that's Pearl, uh, the second couple to the left um, is Pearl and her husband Itzik. Um, on the left, Nathan, her brother with his wife, and then on the far right, her older sister Sarah with, with her husband. And then standing, there's her younger sister Rachel, and with her arm over the shoulder of um, cousin Mendel. Um, unfortunately, the person who's missing from this picture, obviously, is um, Grandfather Bell. Um, he died uh, after Pearl left for, um, for Canada, and she never saw him again. Um, and that was that was a, obviously a great sorrow to her. She said afterwards, he gave me his soul so that I could go to Canada. Um, he gave her all the money that he could that he could and insisted that she go even when um, when she had her doubts. Um, and my story finishes in 1926 when uh, Pearl gets married to Itzik. And that's uh, them on their wedding day. And um, pretty much nine months later, their first child is born, my Aunt Lil. And six years after that, in 1932, my father was born. So Pearl moved to LA in 1956, um, after my Aunt Lil and my dad both ended up in California, having moved there from Winnipeg. Um, and as I said at the start, by the time I knew my grandmother, and I, I really never knew her terribly well because we lived so far away, um, so by that time, she was living in a little apartment in West Hollywood on the second floor of a block built around a swimming pool. And she was a tiny, fragile, stooped old lady with skin so wrinkled um, that she, she looked like an old walnut. Um, this is Grandma, how I remember her in the 1970s. Um, she died in the late 80s. Um, and writing her story long after she died, I found it incredibly hard to equate the person recounting these stories with this lady, with my grandma. Um, she was so t frail and tiny uh, that I couldn't imagine how she could possibly have jumped on and off trains and endured all the physical hardships that she did. The other thing I found amazing um, was thinking how she and I, just two generations apart, could have led such incredibly different lives. And of course, how close to death she came on so many occasions. And if she hadn't survived, um, then I wouldn't be here now. And before I finish, I'm just going to put on a little slideshow of some of the pictures of Pavlich um, that I took when my father and I visited Ukraine uh, back in 2005. So while that's running, um, I'd like to say a few words about um, how this book came about. So I've got my dad to thank for that. Dad was a historian. He studied at Santa Monica City College and then at UCLA before he won a scholarship to Cambridge University in 1959 and emigrated to England. Uh, that's where he met my mum and that's how I turned out to be English. And the dad later became a history professor in a city called Norwich, which is where I grew up. 
And then back in the 1970s, when Pearl was an old lady, Dad made recordings in Yiddish on old cassette tapes of her telling stories of her life back in Russia. And we're very lucky that Grandma was a great storyteller. Unlike so many Jewish immigrants who came to the West who very often refused to talk about the old country, saying they were terrible times, and they, they chose instead to forget about it, um, not to pass on their memories. So I knew of the existence when I was younger of these, of these tapes that Dad had recorded, but I didn't know Yiddish, and as a child I'd never been sufficiently interested to ask Dad about them. Uh, but then later, when I was studying for a master's in Russian history, I thought it might be interesting to write my dissertation about the Russian Civil War, which I knew that Grandma had lived through. And it was then that, that, that I asked my dad if he would translate the tapes for me. So hour after hour, dad translated while I typed. And I was just astounded by the stories. I had had absolutely no idea up until that point of what my grandmother had lived through. Um, and so that was, that was really when I decided, I decided to ditch the dissertation, ditch the masters. And I set about turning grandma's story into a book. And if you'd like to hear a few snippets from the cassettes and hear some more of Pearl's stories in her own words, you might be interested in a short radio documentary um, that I made with the BBC a couple of years ago. Um, that's it on screen now. The URL is up there, or you can find it by searching for BBC Witness History and Jewish in Imperial Russia, which was the name of the programme. If you'd like to get hold of a copy of the book, you can find it on Amazon, either as an ebook or as a paperback. Um, so thank you very much indeed for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. And I hope to see you in Altadena soon.